Okay, good evening, folks, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages. Um, glad you're here tonight. And uh, whoa, good to see Barbara and Wayne. Um, they are usually our online crowd, but uh, they're here tonight. Thrilled to have you. And uh, you, we got cookies. They are disease free, as far as I know. <laughs> Um, glad to have you, and for those watching online, glad that you're here. A um, little different format, if you notice, I'm on the floor today, I've been on the stage, and the re this is where I usually have taught. The reason I've been on the stage is because of the, uh, um, the cord for the projector was not long enough, but I have a new cord. So now it is long enough, and I'm a happy camper. Um, because now I don't think I need the spot so much because i got a, a big light on top of me here, which uh, should take care of me. All right, well, let's begin with a word of prayer and uh, dig into some fascinating stuff tonight. Father, we thank you that we have the opportunity to study your word on this, the church's Holy Week, leading up to uh, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter Sunday morning. Uh, Father, as we lead up to these days, we pray, Lord, that you would bless us, grow us um, to be uh, just deeper in our faith, growing and established and firm, and that everything we learn is not purely academic, but also stretches us and grows us to be the kind of men and women you've called us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Got some fly or something coming on me. As I was praying, I like something just landed right here. What is it? But I think we're good now. All right. Uh, with that in mind, we have a quiz for those of you watching online. The way to see the quiz is you go to the church page, click events, then you click uh, small groups, then you write in in the in the box Kings, and you'll see it. You need to register, and then you can access the uh, quizzes. Um, so let us look and see what we don't know. Quiz number two of Second Kings and see what we know. Some of us are affirmed in this. Some of us hold your head high that you've done well and others cry in shame because it just hasn't worked the way you hoped. All right. Baal Zebub may mean Lord of Dung. Lord of the Flies, which was on me a moment ago. <laughs> My Lord is Prince, Lord of Healing. And it is potentially three of them. Everything except Lord of Healing. Now, why that was tempting is because the king was looking for somebody to heal him. And uh, he uh, you know, went to the Philistine area to, to get healed by Baal Zebub. However, the way it is written in our text, it is translated Lord of Dung or Lord of Flies, but we think that it may be part of Elijah's sarcasm to change it to uh, Lord, uh, change it from my Lord as Prince. Because one letter difference would be my Lord as Prince. That is why um, some people think it's changed in the translation, perhaps because of Elijah's sarcasm. Remember, Elijah's the guy who said at the, the Baal sacrifice, is your God sitting on the toilet? You know, all these kind of things in his uh, sarcasm there. So, number two. Moab could be called an uh, ancient superpower a vassal state of Israel, part of Edom, a province of Israel? And the answer is a vassal state of Israel. Today, as I was preparing for tonight's class, it occurred to me, I don't often define meanings. And I realized pretty much into my late 20s, I did not know what a vassal was. And so I shouldn't really assume that everyone knows what a vassal is. So just to remind us all, a vassal is a country that pays taxes to a bigger country 
that's kind of keeping it under their thumb. Um, and so we have, to this day, you'll have things like this. For example, during the reign of the Soviet Union, Poland would be considered a vassal state of the Soviet Union. Czechoslovakia was a vassal state of the Soviet Union. East Germany was a vassal state. In other words, they didn't have freedom. They had some autonomy, but they still had to accept all the troops of the Russian army you know, to come through, and, and Cuba, in some respects, was a vassal state. Um, so that is a, a kind of an example. And I would say it's more or less where Taiwan is probably going to end up in terms of China. Um, if they maintain some freedom, they'll, be, they'll potentially end up being a vassal state. They're, on the, they're teetering on that edge right now. Um, we'll have to see what uh, history holds. But that's what vassal means. And, and at this point, Moab was paying their taxes to Israel in the form of livestock that they would deliver every year. They were experts in raising livestock. Who had a very serious fall? Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, Ekron had a very serious fall. And the answer is Isaiah had a serious fall Th through a very flimsy wood that was on the roof of his palace. And he just fell and it looked pretty grim, asked for help, but he doesn't ask the Lord. Two captains of a company of troops found themselves, A, in deep water, in a hot situation, in awkward position, on Elijah's bad side. Now, I would say the answers would be B, in a hot situation, in that Elijah called down fire and consumed them. That would be a hot situation to me. And D, on Elijah's bad side, because they definitely, if I am a man of God, may fire come down and consume you. And if I had to rate the stupidity of these two captains, the first one may have been stupid, but the second one was an absolute idiot because he actually raises the bar of insulting the prophet. You get down here at once. It's like, are you not sure what's going on? And, uh, of course, that didn't work out too well for him. But the third captain had some common sense. Please, please let me live. <laughs> and he did. Elijah is described as hairy. B, wearing a garment of hair. C, a leather belt. D, a bald man. Hmm. The answer is the first three but not the last one, because that's Elisha. Elisha is the one who's insulted. Go up, you bald head. And uh, that is not Elijah. Now, you may think to yourself, wait a second, I thought it was a garment of hair. Not that he's hairy. But if you were in class last week, you would have heard that it could be translated either way, that he was hairy or that he wore a garment of hair. But because of our New Testament, with unambiguous Greek language in that particular case, we know that John the Baptist wore that garment of hair. And so most scholars lean to garment of hair instead of hairy for Elijah. Could have been both. Um, he may have been a hairy person. Yes. You know, I, uh, I could use the garment of hair myself up here. You know, that would be potentially helpful. Mary and I were talking. She said, do I have any pictures of myself when I had hair on my head? And I showed her. I had hair, yes, at one point. It was there. I, I said, though, when I started losing my hair was in my 40s, which is a good time to lose it. If you got to lose hair, 40s is a good time. Because, you know, I got my wife. She remembers what I looked like. I was cute at one point. I still got blue eyes. You know, that's always an asset to me. I'm like, you know, they, they hang in there Till you, till you go. So <laughs> I'm happy with those. Number six, Elijah's angelic visitation can be described as a visit from A, the angel of the Lord, B, 
a seraphim, B, uh, another B, <laughs> that should be a C, a cherubim, and D, Jesus. Now, the strongest answer is A. It specifically says the angel of the Lord. The reason, though, why you could give yourself grace and put Jesus is because when the phrase, the angel of the Lord, shows up, sometimes it is potential to be a pre-incarnate visitation of Jesus. An example of that could be when Abraham is visited by the three visitors and one of them is called the angel of the Lord. And that conversation is potent and significant. And there are scholars who would say that could be a pre-incarnate visitation of Jesus. But in this case, that phrase shows up, I believe I said last week, three times in First and Second Kings. This is one of them. And in none of those visitations in Kings do they think it is uh, a visitation of Christ. Um, but it is an interesting phrase, and it, it seems like it's not just a regular angel. It could be of a, a higher level, like Gabriel or something like that, because there are some distinctive angels, Michael, Gabriel, uh, to be an example. Number seven, Elijah seems to have multiple, A, schools of prophets, B, companies of prophets, C, sons of prophets. D, nonprofit organizations. And the answer is the first three. The Hebrew actually says sons of the prophets. And that is not meaning literal sons. So it's usually translated the company of prophets or school of the prophets. And it seems to be I like the phrase school because there seems to be a training aspect. We'll actually see that tonight um, as to how that is implied in one of the phrases that takes place. But uh, I, I like the whole image of that because it, it does convey it is a, a, a something you learn, something you gain. I truly have enjoyed um, having people take uh, like my leadership class that I just finished at Lindbrook Baptist Church um, or the preaching class. God bless you, by the way. Um, I say that because these are people hungry to want to learn more, want to gain more. And, you know, it's not that I have it all figured out or Pastor Henry has it all figured out, but we've lived a little bit more. You know, we've figured some things out. We've made some mistakes and have gained some knowledge. And there is a community of people that want to say, count me in. I want to learn a little bit more. Uh, by the way, when we come to March, excuse me, May 14th, Saturday, we're going to do the casket empty again. And it's rigorous. But if you would like to know the full picture of the Bible from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., it's a long kind of full day, I encourage you to go. You know, that we'll feed you. Um, it's a minimal cost to be a part of it, but what it really does is give you a full rundown of the whole Bible, and it really expands the book. Um, I was riding on my scooter, in which I often do a lot of pondering, because I do not have a radio on my scooter, so it's me, the road, and the Lord, you know, and uh, sometimes I'll sing to myself, but I was thinking to myself just this past week how grateful I am that last year I taught through the book of Isaiah. I just learned so much. Now here I have gone to seminary. I even took Isaiah as a class in my doctoral work from a Hebrew professor. And I still learned so much teaching through it verse by verse. And I now am in so in love with the book of Isaiah. I mean, and there are parts that make me cry, parts that make me excited, parts that make me hopeful, you know, all of it uh, that are wrapped into it. And that's the kind of thing that exposing yourself to the fuller breadth of Scripture can do for you. Um, you know, I think to myself that should the day come 
where I you know, cannot read because my eyes just don't provide or, or cannot hear because my ears just don't work the way they used to. I now have memorized a significant portion of scripture that in my mind, I just go through them. Um, and that's, that's fun. By the way, a fun challenge to do. I did this with the staff, they didn't like it. Um, I said, we're all stranded on a desert island and we now need to rewrite the Bible. Let's start in Genesis and see how much we can rewrite. If not word for word, which of course is not gonna be successful, thought for thought. So, Genesis 1, what happens? And, you know, we plotted our way through Genesis to see, you know, when we got to the flood, then we get to, you know, uh, you know, list of names, then you get to Abraham being called, and, you know, all this kind of stuff. But if you know the book, you can do this in your head. By the way, I also decided what I'm going to be teaching in the Bible class this coming fall a book that I need to do the same thing I did with Isaiah. I need to fall in love with the longest book in the Bible. Now, what's the longest book in the Bible? Anyone? Uh-huh. No! <laughs> it was fun to trap you on that. Do you know, Fanny? Jeremiah. Jeremiah! Bless that sister. Love her. Yeah, it's Jeremiah. Now, we're not talking chapters. Obviously, Psalms has 150 chapters, but some of those chapters have like three verses in them. But Jeremiah, in the Hebrew language, which was written in, is the longest book in our Bibles. And I realize I know many verses in Jeremiah, but the whole book as a story, as a, an adventure, if you will, I need so much learning to gain. And so I'm excited. Um, so that's, I mean, for some of you may be like, oh, good grief. I'm skipping that Bible class. <laughs> it all depends on how God wired you. Um, yeah, I, that's a different question, Bob. That is a different question. <laughs> you know, if, if I'm feeling compassionate to Mary, it will be in Manasseh. <laughs> if, if I'm feeling compassionate to Wilson and <laughs> Bill, it'll be in Syosset. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens there. Maybe it'll be both. Remember, I used to do both. Um, Those days could come again. I have fun doing it, so it's not burdensome to me. And the bottom line is, if I teach one, I've already done the work. And the beautiful thing, for those of you watching online, I I record them both, but the one that's better, I keep, you know? So it's like, oh, we'll we'll publish that one. Because it's true, like if you were here Sunday, My first sermon was decent. My second sermon, I felt really good about. I was like, I feel on fire. And I think it was because it was also the biggest crowd we have had since the pandemic. Um, We probably had close to 300 in this, both rooms here. And that was exciting. And what also added excitement, do you remember how in uh, Christmas time, we gave a $70,000 gift to Living Hope Church well, the pastor who is in a wheelchair, he came on Sunday to our 1030 service. Yeah, well, he, he was here, but he only let me know 8 o'clock that night, the night before. And so Nehru Grant was here on Sunday morning. We applauded for him. His whole family filled the entire row here. It was, it was awesome. And uh, say it again. You did. Good for you. Good for you, Mary. But I, I loved, it was just a good morning. Were you in the second service or the first? Second. Second? I wasn't in my regular Oh, okay. The third service, though, I thought I was mediocre. <laughs> it just, you know, it's the lighter crowd. It takes away some of your energy. But also, the person who was doing the PowerPoint kept on putting the slide either too late or in advance. And it was distracting me. I'm like, no, no, go back one slide. No, go forward two slides, you know. And it was just, it was getting down my head. Um, I'm grateful for our volunteer, so I'm not picking too hard. But it was, it was a little annoying. All right, number eight. Elisha wanted a double latte, scotch, cappuccino. Now, if you got this one wrong, hide your head in shame. Double portion. 
Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you know what? I have had none of those. None of those. I have never had any alcohol except I did taste wine when I dated a Lutheran girl. Um, and I've tasted champagne at weddings. You know, when I took a sip, because you're supposed to, it's a toast. But I've never tasted beer. I've, I'm just have not imbibed. So when it comes to the harder stuff like scotch, not even close. My wife who does drink, I'll say to her, what does that taste like? You should clarify that when you dated the Lutheran girl, you tasted wine in her church. Yes, in her church. At his church, I might add. <laughs> it was St. Peter's in Huntington. And I just assumed at the time, all churches drink grape juice. I didn't even phase me. And so I don't know if they had cups of it or whether you went up and took a sip, but whatever it was, it burned. You know, the port wine, I guess they use. But I was like, <laughs> it was a bit much. All right, two more. Who does not like it when outward appearances are made fun of? A, Elijah, B, Elisha, C, Isaiah D. Will Smith. And I think in fairness, there's two here on this list. <laughs> Elisha, go on up, you bald head, uh, which is what the Hebrew says. The NIV puts it a little different. Get out of here, bald head. And Will Smith definitely does not like somebody messing with his wife. Did you hear they judged what he has, uh, his punishment? I think it is that he cannot attend the Academy Awards for 10 years. I think he could still win, but he just can't attend the awards. But uh, I, I read that this week somewhere. Um, interesting, interesting. Out of curiosity, did anyone like watch the Academy Awards when it happened? Yeah. You, a few of you did? Because I, I, there was nothing exciting to me to, to watch. So it's so these days you can watch everything on YouTube like two minutes later. So uh, I did see it that way, but I did not watch the Academy Awards. Yeah, I have to say though, I, you know, I comedians sometimes can mess with you, and you know, Chris Rock definitely said things about his wife, no question about that. You're going to be in GI Jane two, you know, uh, shaved head kind of thing, but he did keep his cool. When it's all said and done, this guy kept this cool. I was pretty impressed. It almost made me feel as this whole thing staged. And who knows? Maybe it was. Some day we'll find out. But he kept so cool in the process. Um, I have to hand it to him. That was pretty good. All right, last one. Elijah's fiery chariot could be called A, a very cool ride. B, a hot rod. C, a theophany, D, the rapture. Now, it is a cool ride, I will admit, and it is a fiery chariot, so hot rod could be given. I mean, you could say that. Rapture, taken away, you know. But the one I was looking for is the one I taught, a theophany. And this is because there is a sense when you're looking at these kinds of things happening that they often in scripture symbolize the presence of God here with us. And so it's possible that it has theophonic, theo meaning God, uh, phani referring to all around. Um, so God with us, God around is what seems to be uh, taking place here. So interesting, out of curiosity, Anyone get with generous grading? All 10, right? Um, nine out of 10? Fanny, I'm waiting for your hand to go up. Mary? Wayne? Barbara? Not yet. I mean, you're supposed to come back with a fanfare, Wayne. You know, like amazing. It's phenomenal. Not so much this time. Not so much. How'd you do, Bob? <laughs> all right, all right. Well, okay, well, let's open our Bibles now to 2 Kings chapter 3. 2 Kings chapter 3. 
But before we start reading, I want to draw your attention to the very beginning of the book. Very beginning of the book. It says in chapter 1, after Ahab's death, Moab rebelled against Israel. And then we are interrupted by all those other stories about Elijah going into heaven, go up ye bald head, you know, all that kind of stuff. Now we are going right back into that story. And um, I want to uh, give you a couple maps just to look at here. So you can see Israel, the northern kingdom, Judah, the southern kingdom, but right across from the Dead Sea, modern-day Jordan, is Moab. Moab is a vassal state, which means they pay dues to Israel, and they've decided, we're done with that. We do not want to do that anymore. So, as a country that is receiving the goods, you're needing to make a choice. You either say, okay, I don't feel like fighting this battle, or you say, no, we're going to fight. Yes, Wayne? I have a question that relates back to the quiz a little bit, when we said that uh, it's a vassal state. Why is it not considered a province? Could it be a vassal province, you're saying? Or well, what's the difference between a province? The primary difference, if I'm hearing you correctly, is that a province is part of the country. And so you could think of Israel having 12 tribes. And so these folks live in Dan, they live in Judah, they live in, you know, any of the 12 tribes, uh, Ephraim. But in this case, it is a separate country. That's why I like the comparison of Poland being a vassal state. Nobody ever claimed that Poland was part of the USSR, but also nobody would claim that they had independence. They, they were under the thumb of the USSR. So they would not be a province in that sense. Does that answer the question? Okay, thank you. Yes. I'm not well. Could somebody help me? Yes. So, how do you distinguish them? Exactly. Great question. So, the question for those of you watching online on the phrase angel of the Lord, what is the distinguishing quality to say that this is a, a pre existent visitation of Jesus or just another angel? And the answer very simply is judgment and context. And so when you look at the fiery furnace, just use that one example, Daniel, who is that fourth man? And he looks like, now here's the phrase that makes it a little more specific, looks like a son of God or the son of God. Some translations have the article, some do not. But the bottom line is that's pushing us to say that may be Jesus. He looks like the Son of God. Now, does that mean it is absolutely unequivocally Jesus? It does not. And the reason why we know this is the text doesn't say that, by the way, this is Jesus. And, and the, the, where we would look for that is, for example, in the New Testament. If the New Testament pointed to that, we would affirm it. But when we're looking at that in judgment, for example, like this passage in Kings, it's not very elaborate. It doesn't seem that significant. It seems like a standard messenger revelation from God. But when you look at, for example, the visitation of Abraham, where he feeds him a meal and he tells him, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and he actually has a discussion with him, we know that God is spirit, but we also know that God in the person of Jesus takes on flesh and blood. And being that he's revealing the heart and intentions of God, it smells like this may be a visitation of Jesus. But once again, does the text absolutely confirm it? It does not. And so what you're doing is you're using your theological prowess to reach a conclusion. 
So in other words, it's not ironclad. It is making a reasonable judgment that this may be. And frankly, if you ever hear a preacher or teacher say, this is unequivocally Jesus, like in the fiery furnace, they don't know that. They're saying based on the evidence, it should be or could be and maybe. I think that's the wiser language. We should always tread humbly in our biblical interpretation. Uh, when we are absolutely confident in what we know and do, we're on thin ice. The youth group, by the way, has been dealing with questions of theology and uh, just questions about life. For example, can you be a Christian and believe in evolution? That was last week's lesson for the youth group. Fascinating question. I mean, to put it another way, can you be a Christian and not believe in the virgin birth? The answer is you can, but because it's not considered the core of what we believe. It is in the next circle around it, and I would say that they would be wrong. However, based on believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, it doesn't have all these addendums, you know, that you have to believe in this, 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 this also. So anyway, this past Sunday, the youth group wrestled with the question, uh, can women be completely equal in all aspects in Christianity? Or is there a biblical distinctive? This is what women do and this is what men do. Um, it's a fair question to ask, to wrestle with. <clears throat> but I, I would, by the way, just so I answer this curiosity, I would be called a complementarian. In other words, I believe that there are roles that God has designated for women and there are roles that God has designated for men but I am as egalitarian as a complementarian gets. Egalitarian means everyone can do everything. So you can have a senior pastor who's a woman. That would be an egalitarian. A complementarian would say that there's a few roles that are only for men. And, I, and my conviction is as I read the New Testament, the position of elder seems to be male. And I could go through a theological reason why and when we look at the passages, when it mentions qualifications for elder, it does not mention women. When it mentions the qualifications for deacon, it says likewise the gunikos, which means woman. And so it seems pretty clear to me that there's a distinction. All right, that being said, more conservative Christians look at me and us and say, how can you let a woman preach? You know, that kind of thing. And they'll point out 1 Timothy chapter 2, where Paul says, and I quote, I do not let a woman teach or have authority over a man. And then he gives the example as Eve was deceived first. So this is his rationale. I do not have a woman have authority or teach over a man. But women shall be saved through childbirth. Okay, so I'm in a debate with a pastor on this subject who was saying, Steve, I heard you're allowing a woman to preach in the church now. And he says, what do you do with uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2? And so I had fun with this because I knew who I'm speaking to and, and uh, we dove into it. So I, I said to him, uh, his name was John, and I said, John, first of all, I, we went through all the other passages in Scripture. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, we talked about Junius, foremost among the apostles. We talked about Phoebe, uh, a prominent deacon. We talked about Philip, who had seven daughters, all of them prophesy. Um, we talked about 1 Corinthians 14, about uh, women shall remain silent in the churches, but Paul's actually shutting it down. Anyway, we finally get to 1 Timothy chapter 2. And I, I said, so what's the reason, John, that women, but Paul says, I do not allow a woman to teach or have authority over men. And he goes, well, it seemed to be related to creation that woman was deceived first. I said, okay, all right, let me ask you a question. In Jewish culture, at what age does a man become a man? And uh, well, he, she, she said, uh, well, that would be age 13, their bar mitzvah. And he said, well, certainly then you wouldn't have a woman lead your youth group. And he goes, well, actually, we do have a woman lead our youth group. And I said, well, you, of course, who is, dece who is the most deceivable in that passage? Well, I guess that would be the woman. Well, 
who are the most deceivable in our church? I suppose the children. So of course you wouldn't be putting the one who was deceived first above the most deceivable in your church. And he said, well, a woman actually leads our children's ministry. So I said, oh, you're completely arbitrary. You know, you're not measuring at all. And then I pushed him a little bit. I said, tell me what it means a woman shall be saved through childbirth. He said, well, that's a difficult passage. We're not really sure what that means. I said, okay, well, that's interesting. You're taking a very cryptic passage and making it normative for the entire church, even though you don't understand what the passage means. And you're completely arbitrary in your interpretation of it. And here's the little dirty secret. There's only one imperative in the whole paragraph. Imperative means command. And here it is. Let the women learn. That's the only command. Paul says this is his habit. He's not making it a command for the church. He says this is his habit, but his only command is let the women learn. And so when I explain this, I think you can make a good, solid case for women preachers. However, I hold back when I say a woman senior pastor and elder. That's my conviction. It's my understanding of scripture because it seems like the plainest reading of the text. What is always to be our measurement though is the scripture. And that's the bottom line. So if you go to a church that says women can do this or can't do this or something like that, I would just push back and say, where are you basing that in the Bible? If they're anchoring it in a good biblical context, I can respect that. But if they're not coming in any biblical context, but just the way we do it, I don't respect that. Yes. I can, so far. It would be louder, though. We don't want to hear you. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I was saying that I agree with you, Pastor. I got that. I had a daughter myself, right? And the one, the one person I looked at in the Bible was like Deborah. Right. Right? She left the reluctant her. judge. <laughs> yeah, the reluctant judge. She led all these men, you know? And they, uh, so I agree with you on that. That's what I was going to say. The second comment I was going to say is that I always hear, and this is what I, this is what I want to ask you, like, what passage in the New Testament says that Jesus appeared in the Old Testament as an angel? Because the one I see that people reference a lot is the uh, uh, wrestling with um, Jacob. Jacob. Mm -hmm. So that's the one. I that is another one. Uh, that the first comment for those watching is a, an affirmation of uh, the discussion of women in ministry. The second comment was relating to. It's frequently said when Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord, that may have been a wrestling with Jesus. And it's one of those examples that it's such a significant event that people say, is this possible? And the answer is, it's curious, but we don't know. But it's fair to raise the question. Uh, by, by the way, I just love talking theology. Ever see Throw on the Roof? And Tevier wishes that he could talk the Bible, you know, all day long. So tomorrow when the pastors get together to talk about the Easter service, and we're going to talk about the scripture, John 20, by the way, if you're curious what we're preaching on, I sometimes open in prayer and say, there are so many in our church that wish they could be paid and talk about the scripture for a living. It is like so unbelievable. It is amazing. I pinch myself. Today, I'm at on the border eating lunch, studying for tonight, and I'm like, I'm eating food I love. I'm studying the Bible, and I'm getting paid. You know, it was like wonderful. Um, boy, am I off track here. Let's dig into our text. I would not say that there is a strong connection with that. Maybe some implied things. I mean, for example, tonight we'll see an implied thing in terms of Elisha will feed 100 people. It is hinted that Elisha reflects Christ in the sense that Christ will feed 5,000 people. You know, so you see lots of connections like that, but usually not line for line. Uh, by the way, an interesting Old Testament passage on women in leadership 
is in the book of Micah because it specifically says that Miriam was a teacher of the people. That's fascinating because here is an Old Testament book, Micah, specifically speaking of the role of teaching and that Miriam was in that role. So that is fascinating. That's why I am a, a, a big believer. And, and by the way, as a preacher, I personally think Pastor Leslie's, I read her manuscripts all the time. I think she writes some of the best sermons that I've seen. And she has grown as a communicator so phenomenally over the years. So I, I love that. It makes me happy. And as a man with three daughters, yes, it does make me uh, happy too. Let's dig in. Joram, this is chapter 3 of 2 Kings. Son of Ahab became king of Israel in Samaria in the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. He reigned for 12 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, but not as his father and mother had done. He got rid of the sacred stone of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless, he clung to the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which had caused Israel to commit, uh, caused Israel to commit. He did not turn away from them. So, just a quick look. Um, this is the sin of Jeroboam was that he took two places, Bethel in the south and Dan in the north, and placed places where they could sacrifice to a golden calf. That was the sin of Jeroboam. So he's still practicing sin. However, he did get rid of something that looked like this. This is a stone depicting Baal. And he, the, this stone was removed from a holy place. So it, it, it was like he was sin light, you know, compared to sin totally ingrained, which you might say is kind of sad. You know, I wish he could have, you know, broken free from this. But he is practicing sin, but not as bad. So this picture here is from Tel Dan. Our team that is in Israel right now, they had the chance to look at this just a few days ago. And this is the site of the temple and that metal structure you see in the, in the middle, that is a depiction of where the horned alt altar was. And when I say horned, you can see it has corners and that is the horns of the altar. So whenever you're reading your Bible and it says, he laid held of the horns of the altar, that's what it's referring to. It's that corner piece uh, of the altar. So, uh, going back to our text, now Mesha, king of Moab, raised sheep. So you see Moab on the map here. He does great at raising sheep. He had to pay the king of Israel a tribute of, get this, 100,000 lambs and the wool of 100,000 rams. But after Ahab died, king of Moab seeks weakness. Maybe this king isn't as strong as the next one and makes the decision, I'm pulling away. So he rebelled against the king of Israel. So at the time, King Joram set out from Samaria and mobilized all Israel, meaning he put together an army. And he sent this message to Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah to the south, and he's a good guy. He's a, he's a godly guy. And he said, uh, the king of Moab has rebelled against me, Will you go with me to fight against Moab? Now, there is a verse that seems to be missing here. I'm being sarcastic. What we want to see as the next verse is, so Jehoshaphat asked the Lord. That's a great question. So, I want to go to this school. I want to get married to this person. I want to do this. I want to do that. Great. Did you talk to the Lord about it? Well, um, uh, no. You know, and just be honest with yourself. Have you asked the Lord? I mean, here's a great question. When is a good time to retire? Ask the Lord. Sometimes he lets you know because your body doesn't work the same way anymore. You know, that's, that's a way. Other times, you know, he'll say no. It's fair to ask the Lord what you should do. 
I'll give you an example of asking the Lord. So 2008, I'm suffering from Meniere's disease. I'm getting dizzy all the time and I'm throwing up in my garbage can at work here at the church. I'm feeling dizzy when I'm preaching and I'm thinking, man, can I even press on as a senior pastor? And I get a call from a mission organization, Mission Door, saying, would you be our board member? You have to fly to Denver twice a year. And I'm like, oh man, airplanes affect the inner ear and this is gonna affect me even more. So I said, I just don't think I can do it. And he said, pray about it. So I should have thought of that myself, pray about it, but you know, he said, pray about it. So I did, I prayed about it. So how does the Lord communicate? So I prayed about it, Lord, what should I do? This is what came into my head after I prayed about it. Something my pastor said when I was in high school. The Lord has a wonderful way of letting you know when it's time to retire, you die. Till then, be busy. That's what came to my memory right after I prayed. I called him up and I said, yes. A week later, a woman in our church came to me and said, Pastor Steve, the Lord told me in the new year, he's gonna take away your Meniere's disease. And I said, I sure hope you're right. January came, the Lord took away my Meniere's disease. And I've been now, well, what, 2008, 2022, you know, good long time, not affected by this disease. So, you know what? I am very grateful, but the verse that is missing here, <laughs> Jehoshaphat's a good guy, but he didn't ask God's opinion. He just shouts out, I'll go with you. Verse seven, I am sure, uh, excuse me, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. This, by the way, is the exact phrase he used for Ahab. There, he actually did say, do you guys have a prophet of the Lord around here? This time he didn't do that. He will do something a little later, but not yet. By what route shall we attack, he asked. Through the desert of Edom. So, I want to show you a picture of this. Okay, here is a route that they're going. So, you see Israel to the north. And you see the line coming down through Judah. Then you see it going south of the Dead Sea and then up through Edom. Now, Edom is a vassal state of Judah. They, the, the king of Edom was actually appointed by Jehoshaphat. So that's a good way to go. It also is a way that would surprise Moab because Moab would expect Israel to attack from the north but they're attacking from the south. So it was, it was actually a, a, a decent strategy, except when humanity gets involved. So here's what happens. So the king of Israel set out with the king of Judah and the king of Edom after a roundabout march for seven days. Securitus is another way to say it. Another way to say it is they got lost. They were not doing well on their journey. I mean, you're coming with an army and they're making bad directions. You know, they didn't stop. It's all men. They didn't stop to ask for directions. You know, they didn't have their phones with them, you know, whatever. But they're, they're not doing well. And because of this, they budgeted to have supplies that were inadequate for the journey. And they run out of water. Now, if you've been to Israel, particularly the southern part of Israel, it's parched. It's desert-like. And so this is a tough situation. And that big body of water, the Dead Sea, completely useless in terms of uh, drinking from. It's all salt water. So um, here we are. Uh, they had an uh, army with no more water for themselves or the animals that were with them. What, exclaimed the king of Israel, has the Lord called us three kings together only to deliver us in the hands of, to the hands of Moab? But Jehoshaphat asked, now here's the right question. Is there no prophet of the Lord here through whom we may inquire of the Lord? The officer of the king of Israel answered, Elisha, son of Shaphat, is here. He used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. Now, that is a way of saying he was in the school of the prophets. He used to serve Elijah. He learned from the best. 
That's a beautiful thing. And even today, if somebody says to you, you know, what's the credentials of this guy? And you say, well, he was a student of so-and-so. That changes everything. It's like, oh, by all means, you know, I want to, uh, you know, move forward on that. So that is a, a beautiful statement. He used to pour water on the hands, and that conveys that Elisha is a graduate of the school of Elijah. So, verse 12, Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord uh, is with him. The fact that he is, a, a, if he's good with Elijah, he's good with this guy. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. Now, here's an interesting twist. Usually they're summoning Elijah or Elisha. This time they're going down to him, which, by the way, is a sign of respect. So Elisha sees these guys coming. And interesting because he's not too impressed with uh, Joram as a king. So Elisha said to the king of Israel, verse 13, why do you want to involve me? Go to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. You know, Baal. So he's mocking them. You know, go to your useless gods that never helped you out in the past. And we uh, continue. No, the king of Israel answered, because it was the Lord who called us three kings together to deliver us into the hands of Moab. Elisha said, as surely as the Lord Almighty lives, whom I serve, if I did not have respect for the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I would not pay any attention to you. I have to say, just pausing and thinking about this, we realize that our reputations can be sacrificed if we're advocating for somebody that we should not be advocating for. Um, people ask me all the time, Pastor Steve, I'm moving to North Carolina and I'm going to this particular town. What church should I go to? Now, I know they're wanting me to say that this church is decent. I just had one, uh, Mesa, Arizona, just this week. What church in Mesa, Arizona should I go to? Oh yeah, I was in Mesa last week. I'm being sarcastic. I haven't been in Mesa maybe once in my life. You know, I don't know what churches are there. But you know what I do have a discernment of? I can look at church websites and get a feel for what is there. And so I did that. And I understand that I might have a more discerning eye than just the average person in a church. You can smell different things. Like, believe it or not, just the phrase Christian church, that could be part of the Christian church denomination which believes in baptism regeneration. It's considered in the evangelical community, but you're not considered a Christian until you're baptized. Which I would say is questionable because it sounds like it's a work to get saved. But I have an eye to see that Christian church. Hmm, I wonder if that's part of the denomination. You guys would probably pick up on this, Kingdom Hall. Jehovah Witness. Um, but Church of the Latter-day Saints. You know, those are more obvious ones, but I, when, believe it or not, when you see community church, it's usually an evangelical church that changes name from Baptist. Because they, whenever you, they come up with like this totally innocuous name, yeah, they're probably Baptists who change your name. So, and not always, but you can dig into it a little bit and then you go, yeah, they're, they're a Baptist church. Um, but anyway, Jehoshaphat, extends his reputation to Joram, maybe he shouldn't have, you know, because Joram's not a good king, and it's only for that reason that Elisha's even willing to, to help out here. So, Elisha's going to now prophesy. Get a load of the next verse. Now, bring me a harpist. And so the harpist comes, and while the harpist is playing away, he gives his prophecy. This is not the first time this has happened. Um, what's interesting, though, about this particular case, uh, by the way, let me give you an example of what happened. This is from 1 Samuel chapter 10. After that, you will go to Gibeah of God, where there is a Philistine outpost. As you approach the town, you will meet a procession of prophets coming down from the high place 
with lyres, timbrels, pipes, and harps being played before them, and they will be prophesying. This is a prophecy, by the way, to Saul. The Spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you, and you will prophesy with them, and you will be changed into a different person. Why I'm pointing this out is apparently music associated with prophecy. Now, let me translate this to modern day. Some people get really, really hung up when people are playing in the background when somebody's speaking on the stage. I mean, it just happens all the time. You know, let's, let's say I'm getting to the altar call. You know what I'm saying? Have you received Christ today? And suddenly Kayla's at the piano and, and she's going like this. And some people are like, that is so distracting when they play in the piano or, or something like that. And, and true, for some people it may feel very distracting, but it is biblical that there are times when music accompanies the word of God. I just think that's interesting. And in the African-American church, the pastor, when he gets going, he'll have the organist at the organ the entire time when you're doing it. If you haven't been to an African-American church, it's a fascinating experience. And Jesus said, blah, blah. and then, uh, you know, he died for all of us. Blah, blah, blah. You know, and it's, and it's, if you ever saw The Preacher's Wife, which is a, a fun movie, um, I think it has Whitney Houston is playing The Preacher's Wife, but her husband's doing like a lame-o job at preaching. And so she has the choir start to help him. And uh, like he says, and Jesus said, and the choir goes, Jesus! And he, and he turns and looks at his wife and leading the choir because he knows his wife is like, help him, Jesus, you know, because he's not doing well. Anyway, subtle thing. I think it is interesting. Let's hold our critique about music and speaking. It is not an aberration, scripture does include it. And this is an example. I do agree though, it can be distracting. You have to be very careful on how you use it. While the harpist was playing, verse 15, the hand of the Lord came upon Elisha. Interesting phrase, hand of the Lord, I, I like it. And he said, this is what the Lord says. I will fill this valley with pools of water. For this is what the Lord says. You will neither see wind nor rain, yet this valley will be filled with water, and you, your cattle, and your other animals will drink. This is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. He will deliver Moab into your hands. All right, now I have some fun. So, um, the year was 2012. And we're going to have a Summit Sunday at the church. Now, what is a Summit Sunday? We are having a video of a previous Leadership Summit speaker shown to entice people to sign up to go to the Leadership Summit. And the week we're doing it, we're doing Stephen Furtick from Elevation Church, who's preaching this exact passage. Now, I am going to be in Illinois taking the book of Isaiah with my Hebrew professor and I'm not in church. I flew out on Saturday and this guy named Matt Steen was going to be our campus pastor that day and, you know, welcome everyone to church and all that kind of stuff. That week we had just put in the brand new Bibles that are underneath the old chairs now, which is the new international version 2011 update. The previous Bibles were from 1984. Stephen Furtick is preaching from the 1984 Bible. So this is what he preaches. While the harpist was playing, the hand of the Lord came upon Elisha and he said, this is what the Lord says, make this valley full of ditches. For this is what the Lord says, you will neither uh, you will see neither wind nor rain, yet this valley will be filled with water, and you, your cattle, and other animals will drink. This is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord, and he will also hand Moab over to you. Does anyone hear the difference between these two passages? I'll go back to the other one. For this is what the Lord says, verse 17. You will see neither wind nor rain, yet this valley will be filled with water, and you and your cattle and animals will drink. Next one. 
For this is what the Lord says. Um, excuse me, verse right above it. This is what the Lord says. Make this valley full of ditches. Go to the other one. I will fill this valley with pools of water. Do you see the difference? It's actually significant difference. So here's Stephen Furtick's message. You do your part by digging the ditch and God will do his part by filling it with water. That preaches. I mean, we preachers love stuff like that. Matt Steen calls me up and says, Steve, we have a problem. Because if people open their Bibles, the Bible that's under all the chairs, it's going to say God's doing all the filling with water. There is no ditch digging at all. So being that I'm the only one here blowing in the breeze, how do I respond to this? I have no clue. Um, I looked in my Bible, nothing in the footnotes. I thought that was interesting. The NIV changes it significantly, doesn't put a footnote. So then I look at my commentaries, which I had on my computer. None of them refer to it. None of them. And they, they, so it's not a textual issue. In other words, the Hebrew didn't change. So on my, we, I said to Matt, write it out. If anyone says anything, they may call me on Monday. Because on Monday, I'm going to ask my Hebrew professor. So on Monday, I took my Biblica Hebraica. I went up to Wilhelm van Gemmeren, and I had to make sure I could still find my way into the Hebrew because I'm not so good with Hebrew these days anymore. So I found the passage and I said to him, Dr. Van Gemmeren, the old NIV says dig ditches. The new NIV skips it entirely and says God's going to fill this valley with water. What's going on? There's no footnote. No commentaries refer to it. So he goes like this. Ah, oh, yes. Yes. But he doesn't say anything. So I say, do a lumen. You know, what are you saying yes to? And he says, the old NIV, it, oh, it says it's all who the subject is. If man is the subject, he doesn't make valleys. He digs ditches. Man is very limited. But if God is the subject, he makes valleys and fills them. So he says what happened is the older NIV saw the subject in Hebrew as being man and put in dig stitches. The, 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 the translators for the 2011 said, no, no, no. This is God as a subject here. And God does not dig ditches. He fills it with water, the valley with water. That's what happened. It was all who is the, is it man as the subject or God as the subject? I wish they put a footnote in it. I, it, it does. But um, now Stephen Furtick's point is valid. For example, when they crossed the Jordan, they had to get wet first. In other words, they literally had to get wet before the water was going to stop up and the people crossed over the Jordan. So there is a place in scripture where you can make a case. We have to do our part and God does his part. But this was not one of them, <laughs> is what it comes down to. So if you do a perusal of translation after translation after translation, the lion's share of them say dig ditches. And NLT and NIV just say fill it with water. So interesting little textual thing. Whenever I come to this passage, I am thrown back to that quandary as to what is going on. And you might say, uh, yesterday we talked about humility. This was a humbling moment for Steve because I could not figure it out on my own. I, I just couldn't figure it out. I'm not good enough on my Hebrew to be able to figure out who is the person. And apparently the translators struggle with it too. So interesting note. Moving on. I love verse 18. This is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. Every time you pray something you think is too hard for God, you can add this phrase. It is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. By the way, he might not want to go with your plan, but it is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. And, and keep that in mind. I remember when Pastor Nathan was driving around in his beat up Ford Taurus. I mean, this thing was held together by chewing gum and string. And then a person comes up to him who is nameless, anonymous, and says, Nathan, come on with me. 
takes them to the Hyundai dealership, buys them a new car. This is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. That's God. We don't see that kind of thing happen a lot. He can do what he wants. So I love this phrase. This is a good one to memorize, by the way. It's an easy thing in the eyes. So everything is an easy thing. He speaks worlds into existence. You know what? I think he can handle our issues too. But according to his will and what he intends to do. So we move on. Uh, it says you will overthrow. Uh, he will deliver Moab into your hands. Keep that in mind. You will overthrow every fortified city, every major town. You will cut down every good tree, <clears throat> stop up all the springs, ruin every good field with stones. <clears throat> the next morning, about the time for the offering of the sacrifice, there it was, water flowing from the direction of Edom, and the land was filled with water. Wow. The desert flows. And if you've ever go out west, you see these dry riverbeds. They call them a wash out there. But you're like, why did they build a bridge here? It's just dirt. But if you're in a storm, that dirt could end up being three feet of rushing water. And you have to be very, very careful. So now all the Moabites had heard that the kings had come to fight against them. So every man, young and old, could bear arms, was called up and stationed on the border. When they got up early in the morning, the sun was shining on the water. To the Moabites across the way, the water looked like blood. That's blood, they said. Those kings must have fought and slaughtered each other. Now to plunder Moab. Now, interesting thing. One year ago, the Dead Sea, this is the Dead Sea on that map there. Part of it ended up looking like this. And they could not figure out why it was. They were thinking, is this an algae? You know, what is causing this water to turn red? I think it's interesting that virtually in the same area, red water appears. Um, as, as they said, is it red? What we think actually happened in the ancient world is the, the stones are red. Ever been to Sedona? All these red rocks? If you can imagine that reflecting on water. So it's totally drinkable water that they have, but it's reflecting like Sedona-like stone, and it looks red. But again, I found this interesting. This is just a year ago that this happened. Um, and they weren't really sure they were at the time. I mean, I looked up a few articles on it, but nobody had a conclusive reason why it turned red. Um, but it was intriguing. So getting back to our battle here, that's blood, they said. Now, to plunder Moab. But when the Moabites came to the camp of Israel, the Israelites rose up and fought them until they fled. And the Israelites invaded the land and slaughtered the Moabites. They destroyed the towns, and each man threw a stone on every good field until it was covered. They stopped up the springs, cut down every good tree. Only Kir Harish was left with its stones in place. But the men armed with slings surrounded it and attacked it. Now, it's looking really grim. Looks like it's over for Moab. And here we read this. When the king of Moab saw that the battle had gone against him, he took with him 700 swordsmen to break through to the king of Edom. But they failed. Then he took his firstborn son, who was to succeed him as king and offered him as a sacrifice on the city wall. Hor horrific. Now listen to this last verse. The fury against Israel was great. They, Israel withdrew, returned to their own land. This is where you had victory and defeat came out of the victory. They, they, they could have had it all. Something happened. The sacrifice of the king's son was either so grotesque and so horrible that Israel didn't know what to do about it, or Israel, pagan nation, Israel up the north, they see this, oh, their God is now going to come against us because they have satisfied this God. They lost faith. 
they withdrew. We don't know. I wish I could tell you that the author of Kings filled in all the blanks. He did not. All I know is they snatched defeat out of the claws of victory here. It, it just reversed entirely. Now, another interesting thing. I showed this to you last week, but this is the Misha steel. This is a hard artifact found in Moab depicting this victory. And it's one of those moments where we have archaeology verifying the account in Scripture. That being said, this guy makes it seem like we were wonderful and we were powerful and we're amazing. Kings tells us the other side. <laughs> they had victory in their hands and then they went out with their tails between their legs. So it's one of those things I, I can't tell you what happened. I can tell you what happened. I mean, I should say, I can't tell you why it happened, but I can tell you that it happened that way. They had victory in the palm of their hand, and then they lost it. Okay, moving on to the next category here, the widow's olive oil. These are the fun stories that we get in Sunday school. Just a great, great story. The wife of a man from the company of prophets cried out to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? And pause there for a moment. Here's an interesting tidbit. Josephus is a Jewish historian. And here's another example where I thought to myself, I haven't told you much about Josephus. Who is this guy? He is a Jewish man who actually ended up collaborating with the Romans, but he's credited with writing wonderful history about the past and his contemporary time. He lived from 30 AD to 100 AD. So almost a contemporary of Christ. So when Christ is being crucified, raised from the dead, he's being born. Um, but he tells us from his sources, whatever they are, that the prophet who died in this passage is Obadiah. Now, not the Obadiah that's in our Bibles, but we read this Obadiah in 1 Kings chapter uh, 17, and excuse me, chapter 18, chapter 18. And this is the guy who fed the 100 prophets. He hid them in two caves, and he had to keep feeding them and feeding them and feeding them. This is interesting because he is in debt and he dies. And this widow is left devastated. If Josephus is correct, this guy went into debt doing the good work, keeping these prophets alive. Interesting to know. That's, it's just one of these things, if that is true, if Josephus is right, it makes the story even more pathos, you know, sad. You're, you're wanting to root for this widow. And now Elisha does something very interesting. He says, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. And uh, ever see the princess bride? And uh, the, the guy says, uh, what do we have? Well, we have this, this, this. And I also have uh, a Holocaust robe. He said, well, why didn't you mention that? You know, and the whole point is that turns out to be like a, a big thing to save them in the movie. She was like, not going to mention this. Well, I have a little oil. And by the way, the word mentioned in Hebrew does convey like anointing oil. Do you ever have one of the pastors anoint you with oil and, you know, as a little jar? You know, we're talking small thing. We're not talking she had this huge pitcher. She had some oil, probably a, a craft, uh, you know, something on the small side. And she has a small jar of olive oil. Elijah said, go around and ask your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. So I'm going to give you some jars here to ponder when you're looking there. Don't ask for just a few. Uh, then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour the oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him, shut the door behind 
her and her sons. They brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another. But he replied, there is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. Interesting things to note here are that she shut the door. She did this in private. That, you know, I mean, we don't, we aren't told specifically why. Many miracles this happens. Remember when Jesus heals the uh, Jairus' daughter? Kicks everyone out except Peter, James, and John, and the parents. And the member of the other people who were there present, they were saying, she's dead. You know, don't bother the teacher anymore. Sometimes I wonder if you reason that you'd have to shut the door is you're shutting the door to the unbelief that's around you. Because there's so many people who don't believe you're going to get anything from God. And, you know, from a little God, you get little things. From a great God, you get great things. And there's a lot of people who are naysayers. I'm wondering if her sons, if maybe the villagers and all this kind of stuff would be of the sort that they would down the faith, you know, and, and it wouldn't have happened the same way. The other thing that's curious is if she could have man managed to get more jars, would she have had more oil? In other words, do we limit the blessing of God in our life by not expecting a lot from him? I'll give you an example here at the church. So for me, renting the Tillis Center for the first time was the absolute stretching of my faith. Because the previous Easter, we had 764 people. This is in 19, 2004. And the Tillis Center holds 2,200 seats. I was scared to death to rent this facility for Easter because I thought it would be embarrassing. But I really felt the Lord pushing me to do it. Well, we end up doing it. We had 1,100 that first year. Uh, the last year at the Tillis Center, that, you know, before COVID, we had close to 3,000. 2,967. Um, but there was an elder we had at the church and he said to me, Steve, your faith is too little. I said, what do you mean? And I'm, I'm kind of proud that we're renting the Tillis Center. He says, the Nassau Coliseum is available. He said, Nassau Coliseum is 15,000 seats. I said, are you on drugs? <laughs> you know what? I can tell you of the guys who received the talents, one guy received one talent, one guy received two, one guy received five. I'm a two talent guy. I'm not the one talent guy. I don't bury it in the sand. But I don't rent, rent the Nassau Coliseum either. And you know, that's just not me. But you know what? There are some five talent guys out there that can see God bring 10 talents. And I just may not be that person, but it does make me wonder, have I ever limited myself? is what God is prepared to do. You know, I, and by the way, because of that, I actually did begin investigation, never finished it. Maybe one of my things that I should have done didn't do. But I talked to three key pastors, Brian McMillan, Steve Malazzo of Bethlehem Assemblies of God, and uh, one other church, which eludes me at the moment. And I invited, I tried to invite Greg Laurie to be our preacher and that we were going to have an event at the Nassau Coliseum with our churches and a neutral speaker, well known, that we can invite everybody to. See, the problem when you use other churches, you're kind of like, who gets to preach? You know, you can have a shared worship team, but you can't have like three preachers up there. You know, so I actually inquired, I never got a yes from Greg Laurie. I got kind of like this murky, kind of thing, and I never went with it. But because of that one elder who was pushing me, I did try a little bit. I look at this and I wonder, should she have tried to get more, more jars in the process? Anyway, the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debts, and your sons, and you and your sons can live on what is left. Beautiful thing. Yes. Speak loud.
Yep. We're actually going to have that. That's the next story. Oh, I'm sorry. So we actually, there's, it's very similar to Elijah's story too. But Elisha has one very similar. It's our, it's our next thing we're going to see. If you, if you have the text, it says, the Shumanite's son restored to life. Oh. Which is an interesting thing. So one day, Elisha went to Shunem. I'll show you where that is in a moment. But we're in Israel. We're about 20 miles from Mount Carmel, which means we're pretty close to the Mediterranean Sea. So about 25 miles from the Mediterranean. And a well-to-do woman was there who urged him to stay for a meal. So whenever he came by, he stopped there to eat. She said to her husband, I know this man often comes to our way as a holy man of God. Unique phrase, by the way. Usually they say man of God. This time they say holy man of God. Interesting. Let's make a small room on the roof and put a bed and a table and a chair and a lamp for him. Then he could stay uh, whenever he comes. So this would be a village. The picture on the left is just model. They're both scale models. But you can see these flat roofed houses. And what they did is they built a room on top of it. And this is not unusual in the, in the Middle East. There was enough stability on these roofs that they could uh, add the roof there. And uh, so kind of cool. By the way, when the time comes that I move to Nevada, I'm hoping I'll be able to visit with some regularity. And I'm going to think, I'm going to look for who, who's willing to house the prophet's room. And I, of course, I'm calling myself a prophet when I say that. But, you know, when I'm coming to town, I'll be knocking on, can I stay at your house? You know, kind of thing like that. Um, because I don't want to spend money on a hotel <laughs> if I can avoid it. So this is a picture of where they are, Shunem. And there's 20 miles to Mount Carmel, which is by the Mediterranean. So that gives you an idea. You see the Sea of Galilee up top. See the Jordan River, Dead Sea below. That's where this is taking place. So uh, going back, yeah, we'll leave that on. And it says, so one day Elisha came, he went to his room, lay down there, and he said to his servant Gehazi, call the Shumanite. So he called her, she stood before him. Elisha said to him, tell her, you have gone to all this trouble for me. Now what can, I, what can be done for you? Can we speak on your behalf to the king? or commander of the army. He wants to do a favor. Not a miracle, just a favor. You know, speak to the king. What could be done for her, Elisha asked. Gehazi said, she has no son, and her husband is old. So when you read old, he cannot perform in this sense. That's what it's referring to. Then Elisha, Elisha said, call her. So he called her, and she stood in the doorway. About this time next year, Elisha said, you will hold a son in your arms. Now, in this culture, a son is everything. It's your retirement policy. It is your pride as a woman. And she's been unable to have children. So she doesn't even want to, don't even go there. Unless you're really like ironclad. Don't promise what you can't deliver. And, and this is real. I mean, one of the things that any pastor will tell you that on Mother's Day, we fear, we're like walking on eggshells because every time we celebrate moms here in the church, somebody's hurt because they can't have a child. Now, granted, they have a mom and they love their mom and, you know, it is a universal thing. We all have moms. But if you were unable to have a child, it's an ache, you know, and it, and it hurts, particularly if you wanted a child. So she's like, um, no, my Lord. Please, man of God, don't mislead your servant. <coughs> Excuse me. But the woman became pregnant. And the next year, about that same time, she gave birth to a son, just as Elisha had told her. So she has absolute joy in her life. She has a son. But something bad happens. The child grew, and one day he went out with his father, who was with the reapers, and he said to his father, My head, my head. Heat stroke, um, you know, people have speculated what this may be, but 
Uh, we're not sure. We don't really know.